Born ready. ready. <laughs> We're all ready. Well, here we are. Um, thank you and welcome to another episode of the Six Star Business Podcast. Laban and Marty, Pete and myself from, are we on four different continents? I think so. Uh, here we are. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. I'm so excited <laughs> to see you. And I've been so looking forward to this episode. One, because Marty, you're a dear friend of mine and, and we've talked for so long. And when you were saying you wanted to come onto the podcast, I was like so super excited. And secondly, well, because Laban is such an amazing person and I am always fascinated by who books in to these episodes because it's random, right? You guys didn't know, don't know each other. You just booked in. And when I saw who you were talking with, I was like, wow, I can't wait for Me. this. Episode. Me too. Me too. When I, when I saw them pop up on the calendar, it was like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. And uh, how we how we like to get started with these is to keep it nice and friendly. It's like Pete always says, it's like sitting down at a, at a table at a, at a wine bar or a cafe and we're sitting around a table and we're at a conversation between friends. Um, obviously, Pete and I will probably step back on the conversation because we're here to hear from you uh it's a rolling conversation but how we like to get started is to just ask you to share with our listeners first of all who you are where you are in the world who you serve and perhaps something you like to do when you're not working who'd like to kick us off ladies first marty oh how gallant. All right. <laughs> My name is Marty Spiegelman. I'm in California, just north of San Francisco. So the kind of the middle of the left coast here. And um, these days, my work is to train entrepreneurs, change makers, leaders in the technologies of consciousness. And this is uh, wisdom that comes from indigenous cultures, a lot of it from the Americas, but uh, the rest of it from all around the world. And it has to do with how we use awareness and perception to innovate, to move through change, to actually steward change, to not loop backwards. And it's quite interesting work. Um, I've worked with people around the world in all professions and um, we're going strong with the training programs here. So it's, it's really interesting and it's spectacular to be part of Six Star and this multi-continent conversation today. It's really wonderful. And um, Av, your other question, things that I like to do when I'm not working, um, I love to vacation either in the extreme north, the Arctic in the summertime on a river way at the top of the planet, um, or a beach in the Caribbean, or I have just discovered a new beautiful thing that you can only do once a year, which is helping with an olive harvest. My neighbors have olive trees and we just picked olives the other day and it is so magical. <laughs> so that's a new thing I like to do when I'm not working. <laughs> that, that, it sounds like hard work to me, but also like you say, a magical experience. Oh, completely magical. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, Laban, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Marty. And that one thing per year, I thought you were going to say was Christmas. But, uh, oh, yeah. Trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Laban Ditchman. I'm broadcasting live from Playa de Carmen in Mexico, also on the Caribbean. This is not my usual home, but I'm gallivanting around the world right now, uh, about to kick off a book <laughs> tour. I'm the world's best courage coach. And I teach people to take bold, decisive and courageous action so that they may live a life of purpose and fulfillment. And that ties in with what I love to do. I love to put myself out of my comfort zone because the title, the world's best courage coach comes with large responsibility. And so I ask myself before I do anything really, how would the world's best courage coach approach the situation? And it's, it's a commitment that I make to myself. And since I've relatively recently adopted this moniker, it has changed my life in the most extraordinary way ever. Mm. Wonderful. I think we're all kind of stunned going, wow, could I do that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's... So what does what the world's yeah. best courage coach do when he's not 
coaching others to be courageous? I, I have an interest in ultra sports. I, I've had a dabble, not a professional, but I like to run ultra marathons and experiment yeah. with, uh, uh, like to give you an idea, I ran a 50 kilometer in July of 2021. And I did the whole thing on zero carb, zero sugar, just as a wee experiment to see how I, how I could do that. And uh, took me took me six and a half hours, but I did it and um, very interesting. And uh, I just, I love everything that the world has to offer. And, and uh, I'm really excited to be alive at this period in history and, and very, very blessed to be on this podcast. And for those that are listening, if you haven't subscribed, get on, subscribe and like and rate this podcast because six stars doesn't come along very often. Wow. <laughs> Unsolicited plug. I love it. Yeah, and I like this guy's style. <laughs> <laughs> I love it too. Thank you. Well, um, wow. So California, Mexico, Australia, mm -hmm. and the UK. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. And just to say that it was a great, great comment there, Laban or plug for the six star business, but here's, here's the segue into the conversation. You know what does it what does it mean to be six star, and can you tell us how how you've come to be on the podcast and and what you know what drew you to the podcast in terms of that six star notion? Mm -hmm. Well, money, I can go first if you like. Yeah. The yeah, I've had two I've had two six star experiences in my life, and the first one was the. Uh, a, six star cruise ship called the Paul Gauguin and it was uh, based in Tahiti and in 2003 I won an incentive trip with the company that I was working for in Australia and it was at all expenses paid it was about 35,000 US dollars for two and I took my father it was the best week of his life he reckons and they had a two Michelin starred restaurant on the boat and I grew up in abject poverty for most of my life and that was my first foray into a six star experience. And so when I heard about coming on the, the podcast, and I got to thank uh, Alexandra Andre, who I know I think was a former guest on the podcast, for the introduction to you both and, and uh, inadvertently to you as well, Marty. I was very excited because my, my impression, my interpretation of six star is really the best of the best. And I understand there's a seven star hotel, but I don't know really whether they are or not. Six star, I think, is where it's, where it's at. That's very interesting. My my six star is is a different uh, lens. And um, when I first heard that Av and Pete were doing the six star movement and how to become a six star business book and all of these six star things, in in the things that I teach people, there's a there's a concept of the fifth level of consciousness. And all of this change in the world right now, the idea is that we're approaching a, a time when we meet ourselves again. That's how they say it. But meet ourselves again at the next level of consciousness, which is the fifth level. And um, I've always thought that's not high enough. <laughs> and I've always thought that Western people are are bound to meet themselves again, not at the fifth level. We'll, we'll look for the same thing and meet ourselves the way we used to be. So the idea of leaping to the sixth level was so delicious to me that I said to Ab, you know, sort of everything six star, I will help, I'll join in, I'll contribute. <laughs> and so being on the podcast is just part of that. So I think that, um, and Laban, it really ties in with what you do is like, like really, really going for it. Let, let's take an extreme leap. Let's not take little tiny steps. This is time for quantum leap. So for me, six star is like quantum leap. It's, it's beyond the wildest dreams. Like why not? And why not now? Amen. I, was a, a, I remember, uh, was it um, Steve Sandor, I think on a previous episode said that mm -hmm. The, the sixth star is not a linear progression. It's not one, two, three, four, five, six. It's one, two, three, four, five. The sixth star is in a different galaxy. It's in a different universe uh, than, mm -hmm. than we than we, uh, we, yeah. we currently know. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's time for exponential move. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I always think 
the, the changes in the world right now, it can be so chaotic if you look at the world one way, but all of that is free energy. And if we learn to use it right, then it's going to be an exponential change. It will be an exponential move to what we're calling six star. And so I think that means people have to really um, change how they look at the world, entertain some new ideas, and maybe change in chaos is just free wild energy that we can use to do some great things that we've never done before. Mm. Mm. Which, which implies an element of courage, really. And I'm not, I'm not trying to fit. Yes. The, I'm not trying to fit the messages and the guests together. But it seems to me that when when you what you are embarking on something which is, yeah. you know, to infinity and beyond, there's an element of of you know, courage required to, to, un, to undertake that. Mm -hmm. So what, what would the mm -hmm. world's best courage coach advise about going on the six star mission? Well, I think it's a very, very important question, Peter, and, and I'm really glad that you asked. The, the whole premise around the commitment to being the world's best courage coach is the ultimate commitment to myself, because why aim for second, third, fourth place? Why not aim for first, and it's not to the detriment of other people. And I've seen on other interviews, the other podcasts, we talk about a rising tide lifts all boats. It's not about trying to knock other people off. It's a commitment to myself. And as a still a very deeply flawed indiv individual, I still have a very long way to go, but that commitment to courage, I mean, without courage, if you removed courage as an actual thing, an entity, whatever it might be from, from our being, you would be incapable of moving, you, you would die. And I think it's so important because courage is the, the fear of the unknown is what really scares people. And it's like what I've been able to achieve in my own life just in the last 18 months is nothing short of extraordinary. I, I have daily miracles and it's through me being having dino balls because what's bigger than regular balls? And it's ironic because <laughs> dinosaurs didn't actually have external testicles, <laughs> but it's a great metaphor, I think. <laughs> never ceases never ceases to amaze you where this podcast goes <laughs> so i hope that answers your question Pete. oh my <laughs> yeah and you know courage is a beautiful word because it comes from the french curve which means heart and heart and love and the principle of love and open-heartedness these are actually principles of consciousness and they go way beyond the, the, the ego level of our engagements. This is the, the soul of who we are is, is that heartfulness and that desire to, I mean, it's like Star Trek, go where no one has gone before, but it's real. I mean, we're, we're wired for that. But I think there's been so much, um, well, it's a very complicated story. We've been living for about 2021 years and cultures have kind of grown inward a little bit. So it's become increasingly rare for a human to actually go out and take a big leap. I mean, we started by walking out of Africa or something like that, right? And very few people have, have that memory alive in them of taking a journey that big. But boy, this is the time that we need to do it again. And in English, the word is courage. And in, in the traditions I teach, there's all kinds of beautiful words in the Quechua language and, and you know, other languages, but it's all the same thing. You know, do we have the heartfulness? Is there some drive inside us? And it doesn't matter if you're anxious or a little afraid, you know, it, it's energy we're dealing with. So, so go out and, and wrestle with some wild energy and make something happen. It's really the time for that. I agree, Marty. And there's a great acronym that you may have heard many times before, but someone may not have heard it. And I think it's worthwhile to repeat it. The acronym for fear is false expectations appearing real. But the real acronym <laughs> should be face everything and rise. And if you Ooh, approach yes. your life like that, <laughs> you will live the life of your dreams. Oh, it's beautiful. You know, in the Andes, they, they say you have to show some teeth sometime. And they're talking about jaguar teeth because that's one of their, their big archetypal bodies of knowledge like that. You've got to like growl and show some teeth and show some positive aggression. You know, it's another thing that we've kind of forgotten in Western culture is 
that biologically there's something called positive aggression. You have to have the energy and the internal fortitude and desire to go out and get some food, to go out and mate and make a family, to have a community, to, to do all the things that we do as part of big living system. And, you know, I think we need people like the four of us shouting on four different continents, or whoever's ready to wake up and do something wild now's the time <laughs> you know we have to remember that this really is our nature yeah well let me ask pete and ev this question before you embarked on this podcast journey which is now eventuated into a book which will be out very soon available at all good book bookstores online what was the fear that you experienced before you launched the podcast i'm just trying to remember what the fear was <clears throat> Great question. Um, it was probably, for me, it was probably around, it could have been a little bit of the imposter syndrome or, you know, who, who are we to be talking about Six Star? Mm. Who are we to do this? Mm. And I think, Pete, you might have said it to me once. Mm. In, in your kind of ponderings. What about you? Huh. There, there's definitely that. Um, and I think that there was also an aspect of, of I, I, I knew that we knew enough people to get going, but would we, would we be able to sustain it? Would we be able to, you know, it was, it seemed like a good idea at the time and it resonated with people we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And those few people came on first and got going. Um, uh, but very quickly that, that, uh, you know, we, we faced that and we rose <laughs> to <laughs> go back to, to what you said there, um, that, that fear. Well, I think both fears um, dis dissipated mm -hmm. pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. And I guess that's your point, isn't it? Is that when you, when you face it and do it, um, feel mm -hmm. the fear and do it anyway, wasn't it? That's one of the landmarks. And what are the, what are the benefits now? What are the benefits of now having embarked upon this courageous act? Yeah. We're talking right. with you and Marty <laughs> at, right now. <laughs> but we've been able it's to attract people from everywhere in all different facets of life and business and have these magical conversations that we can't predict, we can't preempt and we don't, we don't construct them. It's not our construction. We just create the container and allow the energy to flow through. That's it's, it's, hand, it's hands down. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the, the mm -hmm. connections and the relationships that have, formed as a result of the podcast uh, and the conversations that have have resulted uh it it's all uh people listening to it is almost incidental and i don't if you know the, if you're listening to this now i am not discounting you i value you <laughs> we appreciate you we love you uh, but make sure you like and subscribe as well do what Leva said um so this is not coming from a position of, of, of discounting but it but it's so do you know what i mean love it's that's it's, it's, it's almost you know so i know some people start a podcast and they, they're going for you know how many how quickly can they get a hundred thousand downloads and it's the number of listeners and whatever. And, and, and for us, it's, it's much more precious for us to have this space so we can have the kind of conversations that we, that we have. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and well, thank you for asking, Laban. I just want to say, we don't normally get asked questions on the podcast. <laughs> It's outrageous. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Damn, that's what happens when you that's what happens when you invite a podcaster on the show. They just turn yeah. the tables on you. <laughs> the master at work. <laughs> yeah. But I love the I love the modeling here. Um, Ab, when uh, you and Pete talk about that early sense of well, who are we to talk about six star? Um, when I'm training people, I always um, hammer this one point that everything inside us came from outside us. Every idea, every insight, every download, we call them downloads. They're not downloading from your brain to your brain. They're coming from 
I don't know, the universe. We don't have a good word for it in English, but it's coming from outside you into you because you're attuned, you're resonant to the convergence of that idea. So it's more like, who are we to question a beautiful idea like that? Whoa. And the two of you had the courage to just run with six star. And now you're describing all the other connections that are being made. It's exactly how full consciousness works. It flows, it connects. And if we're lucky, uh, the person it connects with keeps connecting, flowing and connecting. And pretty soon you've got a living network that's, that's based in, in desire and love and vision and action. And um, the two of you are, are doing it. It's a huge modeling for everybody. That's really interesting, Marty, because um, I've, I've said many times and expressed it to have that the, 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 this idea, the, the notion, the, the, the concept, the, 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 the abstract um, idea of, of being six star sometimes feels like something that Av and I just tri tripped over on the ground and we looked down and we picked it up and, and saw it and it's like well what, what are we going to do with this but but i said it from the point of view that that if we hadn't stumbled over it and picked it up and looked at it that's it it it, it wanted to be expressed some somehow and that yeah. if it wasn't us yeah. it was going to be someone else and it's like as soon as we picked it up and showed it looked at it ourselves mm -hmm. and showed it to other people it's it's now we're, we're playing catch up with it or almost it's like it's uh it's uh has a life force of itself do you do, do you feel yeah. like have does that make sense or mm, am i absolutely. talking out my bum either <laughs> folks you only hear this sort of stuff on the six star podcast <laughs> can i can i share a story that will explain why I'm exactly in Mexico right now that I think you'll find at least interesting. And it started, I, I have a book coming out in a couple of weeks. So this is being recorded in November, 2021. And the book's nearly out and I was uh, garnished a few endorsements for the book, some amazing people, but I was thinking about who else I could get to endorse the book. And I had a great podcast with a guy called Justin Langer. Justin Langer is the head coach for the Australian cricket team. And uh, a wonderful human being, very service orientated, real go giver mentality. And and uh, but before I asked him and reached out to him, I wanted to go back over the footage of our interview together to make sure that I had some value to add to him because he he does a lot for people and can't just burden someone with that responsibility without giving something in return. And over the 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 podcast, a bucket list for him is to have pink come and have a barbecue at his house with him, his wife, and his four daughters. So they're crazy fans of Pink the Singer. And I interviewed a guy called Steve Sims earlier in 2021, who's known as the Wizard of Oz. He creates these wonderful, magical events for people with uh, significant wealth. And for example, he arranged for people to have dinner at the feet of David's statue in Rome, had the museum to themselves, and then got Andre Bocelli to come out and sing for 30 minutes a cappella, right? This is the kind of stuff that he does. So, so I bought a copy of Steve Stim's book, which is called Blue Fishing, which I would highly recommend that people read, and uh, through Amazon, and wrote this email saying, hey, Justin, uh, this guy can make this wish come true, right? And, but then I, and, and uh, so I sent that email off, and I kept watching the podcast, and there was a guy that Justin bought up by the name of Andrew Matthews. And Andrew Matthews changed Justin's life forever because when Justin was 18, before he got picked for the national cricket side, he bought a copy of this book called Be Happy. This book has sold millions of copies around the world. The, the author is a Queensland based guy. And when he signed the book, he drew a caricature of Justin in his cricket gear and, uh, and then wrote the number 250 above this caricature. Now, have a guess at what Justin Langer's highest ever cricket score was. 250, right? And I thought, I wonder if Andrew Matthews knows about this. So I connected with Andrew Matthews on LinkedIn, sent him a message saying, hey, do you know how you changed Justin Langer's life? And he said, no, You're like, what happened? So I said, give me your number and I'll tell you. So I got on the phone and spoke to this guy. He's, he's 60 years old, lives up in Cairns in far north Queensland in Australia. And I shared the story with him and it made his whole week. He was so chuffed. But this guy has sold 8 million books in 
45 different languages in about 70 countries around the world. And we spoke for 10 minutes about Justin Langer, but then we spoke for 70 minutes about me and my book. And he was asking me about what was going on. And he said to me many things, but one thing he said, Laban, you must, before you die, get to the Frankfurt International Book Fair. And I had a look on the calendar and sure enough, it was mid-October, 2021. And so in order for me to leave Australia, I got a letter from my publisher and a lawyer to say, I need to go there for work. And so I've just come from Germany where I went to the Frankfurt International Book Fair, recorded my audio book, and then I had to come and meet my fiance in Mexico. So that's why I'm here. I just love that. There's so <laughs> many things in that, in that story. Um, I, I want to know what happened with Justin Langer. Have you, have you heard from him about- I Haven't heard back. <laughs> oh. He's got the oh, T20 really? World Cup on at the moment, so he's got his hands full, but I've got enough endorsements to sink a battleship, so don't worry about that. <laughs> I want to know when he gets pink. <laughs> I'll let you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so interesting. One last thing. Interestingly, one of the guys who has endorsed the book is a guy called uh, Mark Shulman, who's the drummer for Pink. Totally unrelated, but um, there you go. Very cool. Such a lovely story about the the, the power of of human connection. Like every, every yeah. stage of that story was about you connecting with 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 someone and mm -hmm. yeah i think that power of connectivity is it's part of six star is what i think and i think that um especially after the pandemic when we've been prevented from connecting in so many different ways that this power to connect which is really our nature uh, i think everybody ought to just like let that explode you know, even if you can't travel yet, just connect and see what happens. And so many people, you know, these things come in and it's like a, seems like, like a, a non sequitur, like, why would I bother with that? Just run with it. Anything that comes into your life, just engage it, have a conversation with it, see what comes of it. And, and I think if more people can do that, then we have more courage flowing and people become more courageous. But it's, you know, Laban, it's a beautiful story of how stuff happens. It happens in this crazy, wonderful way and it can be global. And so why not? And don't you guys think that's part of Six Star? I think this is one of the, the internal momentums of becoming Six Star. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, that's yeah. one of, of, of literally countless stories uh mm -hmm. of abundance and miracles that have, i said daily miracles and i'm not joking and and uh yeah. that that is largely due to a uh a go-giver mentality with going into every single interaction with what value can i add this person's life from the the checkout chick to the the the, the it service guy who's located thousands of miles away you know like and, and that mindset has is just it's unbelievable the wonderful uh abundance yeah. that has flowed forth into my life as a result yeah, and you know, it changes the idea of abundance and value. Um, that's been just too economized, I think, and too many people think of abundance and value in terms of dollars or Bitcoin or whatever you're <laughs> trading these days. But um, abundance and value has to be in, uh, in terms of well-being. It has to be in terms of connectivity. It has to be in terms of that, that inner sense of richness. So we don't make the mistake again of just collecting all kinds of things and, and amassing too many belongings. That richness in, in our lives and our relationships, it really has to return. And I think this is, this is the time on the planet when it's gonna happen. Mm. Mm. What's your story, Marty? How did you get to be doing what you're, you're doing now? The, the, the kind of things, well, I know a little bit about your, um, uh -huh. Uh, about your story but i think it would be really interesting for the listeners to to hear it from you yeah yeah oh thank you it's um yeah i have a kind of crazy story and i i actually love to have people hear it because i want them to do what i did <laughs> i really do um, and you don't have to know what you're doing that's the, the one of the key um uh, uh, lessons from my stories you, you do not have to know what you're doing <laughs> So I, I uh, was born in St. Louis, Missouri, in the middle of the middle of the middle, right? <laughs> and um, my dad was a fairly famous scientist. And um, that's about all I knew. 
like I grew up with Nobel laureates in the living room and um, was kind of science was the only thing we talked about. And so um, I managed somehow to get into Harvard and I managed to get a, a biochem degree from Harvard, but I actually stepped out of science really fast because my dad was too famous and my classmates, I didn't like them. I couldn't imagine having a career with people I didn't like. <laughs> and so, so one day I, I um, actually dropped my, um, my honors major at Harvard, which nobody does, right? So I, I got just an ordinary degree at Harvard and I went to Yale Design School. And I can't tell you how I managed that because Yale Design School at that time took 12 people per class out of 300 applicants. And I had like a couple of art courses under my belt. That was it. So I don't know, the, the gods did this. So I went to Yale Design School, I became a graphic designer and I had a design firm, very successful design firm in San Francisco for over 20 years. And um, I uh, was very lucky to be designing at the time the Macintosh computer came out. So I had already done PC World Magazine. I did Mac World Magazine. I did Publish Magazine. I was doing all these beautiful things. I had a blast, right? But then um, the 80s came and the economy tanked and design budgets went south faster than you could imagine. And I was tired of dealing with angry clients. And I swear to God, one day I quit. I had too many angry phone calls. I said, that's it. And my, my staff was looking at me going, what? <laughs> so I, I divvied up the clients to my staff and they, had, they became freelance designers with our clients. And because I lived in California, when you have a midlife crisis, you go get some energy healing. So I went, I found this guy from Scotland who uh, was giving me visionary cranial sacral treatments. And one day he said to me, you should study with me. And I'm sort of stuttering, thinking, well, I've got that, you know, I was a designer, but I eventually did. And I eventually taught for him. And then I developed my own cranial program. And one day one of my students said to me, Marty, how do you know all this stuff? How do you see all this energy? And I said, well, let's do a visionary skills course. And I had never uttered the phrase visionary skills in my whole entire life. <laughs> so I dreamt up a visionary skills course and I'm teaching this stuff, realizing what I actually do know. And during this time in the mail, this was at the bare beginnings of email. I'm really dating myself here. Um, in the regular mail, I got invitations to work with indigenous masters on three different continents, unsolicited. I don't know where they came from, but I didn't have that much to do. And it looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> so, mm. Within about a year or two, I had my first levels of initiation in three different cultures and I just kept going. So my visionary skills became an initiation course um, and I taught a lot of students. And then one day in the early 2000s, maybe 2008, 2009, I realized that all of this stuff that I was getting in particular from the Andean traditions was exactly what people were seeking in business. Exactly the same organizing principles, producing value and connectivity and viable systems and it's what everyone was seeking. And so I began this, uh, what's been till now a fairly difficult journey of bringing this wisdom into business. And um, I can tell you, I've learned an awful lot. <laughs> and the training program has evolved as I go. But, but basically now I help entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and change makers change the world by helping them change the way they know the world. So it's really a keen, a very deep training in consciousness and how it works. And it comes, what I love, it comes from indigenous cultures because humans, before modern times, humans were masters of consciousness. They did things in their own cultures that, that we can't do today, even with all of our science. We couldn't do the equivalent of what they accomplished, but we need to. And so I've been talking about downloads. I've been getting downloads and downloads and downloads about how to pass this on. And, and I still do my own initiation and training mostly in South America now. So I go um, every year with a small group and the lineages are being passed to us. So this is not me 
being a silly white person, we're actually being asked to pass this on um, into uh, the Western world and Western people and Western society. So, um, so that's how I came to, to do what I'm doing. And I do use everything that I'm trained in. I use science to help teach this to Western people. I use design principles, um, sociology, anthropology, all of the ologies get woven in as I teach people how these organizing principles work and how to actually embody them. So it's kind of a, a wild and woolly path. But for the listeners, every time I made a change, every time I made a change in career, I just jumped. I didn't sit down and map it out. I didn't go to a financial planner. I did nothing. I thought, oh my God, the thing I was doing just ended. What am I going to do now? I jumped when something showed up. So I encourage people to take leaps <laughs> because that's really how I ended up here. And I've left you speechless. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it's funny the the podcast episode we published yesterday. Um, basically, it was these in the title of the podcast. It's basically just jump in, just jump, just say yes. Mm. Yeah. And I hear what you're yeah. saying. Mm -hmm. you, you've embodied and lived the principle of allowing whatever comes to you from the multiverses in and mm -hmm. allow the energy to flow and you just accepted it, worked with it and allowed it to yeah. you to be the conduit. Mm -hmm. It feels like that. And you are exactly. a steward. Yeah, of yeah. It's what it, you're getting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That that principle of being the conduit, um, just sort of metaphorically imagine the universe flowing through you and delivering energy and information that is attuned to who you are, to, to what your innate gift is. That's really how it works. And if we overthink it, we can stop the flow. And people end up extremely <clears throat> unhappy and they seek out Laban for assistance. Seriously, <laughs> you know, what happened to my courage? <laughs> um, but we do, we have to remember how to allow that flow through us. We have to be in relationship with bigger forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a great quote, Marty. Well, and Pete and Ab and everyone listening that I heard from a guy called Keith Abraham, who's an Australian motivational speaker and author. And he says, when the, when the how, mm -hmm. when the why becomes clear, the how becomes easy. And it sounds like you've stumbled exactly. across your purpose and you're very clear now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, you know, you don't find that unless you're listening to the world around you. You can't find it inside you really not not in an isolated way it speaks inside you your purpose and makes itself known inside you but only if the world is flowing into you and flowing through you because we are not isolated right we are part of exactly mm. exactly these, mm -hmm. a lot of these indigenous tribes uh marty i don't know if anyone's come across the work of western mm -hmm. a price you know that name western a price who is um, a is a dentist in the early 1900s um, that was trying to figure out why uh, he was in North America. He was trying to figure out why all his patients had cavities and caries. And so he uprooted him and his whole family for a decade. And they went and lived and studied all the indigenous tribes, uh, most of them around the world, the uh, Alaskan Inuit, the Maasai Warriors, the Aboriginal in Australia, the New Zealand Maoris, some tribes in Papua New Guinea and in Switzerland. And there's a whole other section with regards to diet and nutrition. But one of the things that struck me, they didn't have police stations and they didn't have hospitals. Right. There was no crime. There was no right. violence or, and so I think, you know, what yeah. you're doing, Marty, is wonderful. Going back and, and looking at our history to help us prepare for the future is just such a key thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. And, you know, these, um, the way indigenous cultures appear to us when we look back, um, they were people living with consciousness. I, I think of consciousness with a capital C, you know, the big consciousness, not human ego-based consciousness. And they were living as part of a larger system. So the, the land around them, the geography, the flora and the fauna, um, taught them what nourished them. And if they nourished themselves well, then they would tend that land well. 
And so people lived as part of a bigger system. And we don't do that. You know, in the modern world, we own the system. We buy a forest and cut it down. You know, we, we own the oil fields and suck it out of the earth. We're not living as part of the system. And that, that's why it's all broken. And it's broken for everything from, from our industries to our health and everything in between, because we're not living as part of the system. But you know what I always think, I, I get really like excited about this stuff, but I think like if we're, if we're six star, here's another view of six star. If we're six star, Laban is teaching people how to be completely courageous and out there doing outrageous, beautiful things to the hilt because that's who they are. When we are really being who we are to the hilt, we're contributing to the bigger system. If you really are living your quote unquote passion, that is attuned to the world we live in. Otherwise you wouldn't be here with that passion. And if you're contributing to that, the world is benefiting so it can support you even more in return. And that's how um, cultures used to live in these beautiful quantum leaps of abundance and resilience and fulfillment. But if you cut off your relationship to the larger system, there you are. Mm -hmm. And, and for people yeah. listening as well that are sitting there going, oh man, what is my purpose? What is my passion? There's three questions that you can answer. And it, if you can't answer them straight away, don't worry about it. But if you spend some time working on this, I promise you, you will end up being very, very close, if not finding what it is that you are on this planet to do. And the first question is, what are you world-class at that other people find really difficult? What are you world-class at that other people find really difficult or challenging? Second question is, what do people come and ask you for advice for? What do people come and ask you for advice for? And then the third, the th third question is, what sets your mm -hmm. soul on fire? What do you love to do? And mm -hmm. I, I was able was to work on those questions a while ago, and it's allowed me to figure out my purpose, you know, and, and, and I think Marty's living her purpose. Pete's living his purpose. Evelyn's living her purpose. And, and that's why, you're putting so much effort into what you're doing, but it doesn't feel like work. Mm. And I think that's what you've been talking about, Marty, with a lot of this indigenous stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I also want to say to people listening that um, your purpose evolves. Very few people know their purpose when they're really young. There's an expression of it that comes. Um, like for me, whatever science was, that's part of my purpose, but not to be a scientist, I found out, but I need that kind of information to mature into <clears throat> the kind of work that I do now. And so, so I would really encourage people to just let yourself explore things and don't worry, do I have the answer or not? Don't make it an, an all or nothing event. Um, explore and because that's the only way you find out what you love to do. And you need a lot of different kinds of information these days. So um, so the other side of this coin of finding your purpose is it's it's not a matter of only one answer. It's an, mm. for most people, an evolutionary thing. Mm. Marty, Marty, you, can you I... mentioned... Sorry, Levin, go on. I was just going to say, Marty, mm -hmm. what, the, the Western world have this impression or interpretation of what uh, six star would be from a, a material point mm -hmm. of view. And I'm curious to know what the indigenous populations that you've been working with consider to be the creme de la creme of whatever they're involved with? Oh, God, it's the ability to live as part of the land creating states of fulfillment. It's the embodiment of the land in you and the expression of, of, um, um, of love, not personalized love, but but of unconditional love back out into the land and this system of the land and the light from our sun that creates this world, the land and the light moving into you and igniting your love out into the world. This puts a human being into the system of life and, and it puts us into roles where we are part of the creation of states of fulfillment. And every state of fulfillment, every harvest, if you wanna use that metaphor, is rich and beautiful and contains the momentum and the seeds for the next harvest. So it's not a repetition, it's an evolution, a cycling into larger and larger states of fulfillment, each one with its own internal momentum for more. That's six star and way beyond. 
-hmm. And you can't do it alone. You cannot do it isolated. You can't do it at the top of a hierarchy. You have to be in the collective. Wally, what would you say to, you, you mentioned that uh, you were doing all this work from a personal perspective and realizing that, that it had application in, in business. What would you, what, well, I don't know what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to, to, uh, to, to verbalize or, or, or articulate. Um, that I guess at some level it seems, and excuse me if I'm kind of played devil's advocate, but yeah. I just kind of want to get it from both sides, that it does sound incredibly woo-woo, <laughs> to, to borrow that term, <laughs> in terms of, you know, this kind of consciousness and light yeah. and, 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 and yeah. being. Um, yeah. What what real practical application does it have in business? Uh, I'll have to see if I can call a few examples because it applies to absolutely everything in business. So, so let me let me think for a sec. Um, um, let's take all right. Let's let's take a large large organization, some large corporation, right? Um, if it's large enough, it's, it's become fairly rigid in today's world. It makes money in a certain way. And to make money in a certain way, it, has, it controls um, what it makes, how it advertises what it makes, how it distributes what it makes and so on. So there's a very sort of set um, process for a, an existing corporation to get a product out into the world. And the products that we make in general, um, if you have a company that's making something that has a lot of plastic in it, and let's say, oh, it would be more conscious to not use plastic, it's the impact on that company to drop its plastic and substitute something else is enormous, right? You can't just quote unquote, make a, a business conscious if you've already got that, that big structure and you wanna change something and you have this idea, oh, it's gonna be a more conscious business. It's a huge thing. And, and the ripple effect of, through the supply chain of changing your packaging, it's, it's very cumbersome. Uh, it doesn't work the way consciousness works. It's gonna be a very, very big deal. And so probably the change won't happen. So, so let's take somebody who is starting a business I'll come back to the big business in a minute. Let's take somebody who's starting a business, wants to make a similar product. The person who's starting a business is not going to start, if I'm working with them, they're not gonna start by making uh, a framework for the business. That's not how they start. They're not gonna start with a um, like a employment chart and, and HR rules or anything like that. They're gonna start with an organizing principle. I don't even care what their product is. I want to know why they're making it. What is the, the ripple effect benefit of the thing they're going to make? And that ripple effect benefit, is it going to be adversely affected by how they're making it? So we're going to sit with that organizing principle, that axis for a long time until we figure out how that product can be made without trashing the planet and distributed without trashing the planet. And it actually benefits people in all kinds of ways they didn't think about. So the company's gonna make a lot of money, but we haven't done a business plan yet. We're starting with that organizing principle, the axis with which everything else will align. Then from this organizing principle, you start to make connections, whatever connections you need to make. Maybe you need to find stores that will buy your product. Maybe you need to find people who are gonna manufacture your product, but everything is resonating with this big organizing principle. And as you reach out and make connections, 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 you find your employees, the structure of your business appears. And it appears on the basis of this original organizing principle. And it will be a structure like no other business. It will run like no other business. The internal organizations, you won't need a hierarchy. People will be in, in a different kind of leadership slash team relationship inside. And you can't see it unless you start with the organizing axis and work your way out. 
then you have the kind of company people dream of. But you can't go into an existing rigid structure and do that because the structure will, um, it'll fight you every step of the way. Right. Um, now, there are all kinds of intricacies to this. And there, I, I have people I've trained who are working actually in Australia um, in regions where um, uh, industry sectors and government um, cross paths and they're, they're creating small pockets of reorganization where they're using the principles of consciousness to reorganize how certain sectors are working. And um, what happens is that, that there's, there's more profit, there's um, easier flow of production to product to distribution, um, that the uh, understanding of a product's value changes, all these things that we're seeking, they start to change. But it's, it's the kind of thing, you know, consciousness produces things in the moment. The Western way is I want to see the blueprint first, and then I'm going to build to the blueprint. But that blueprint, honestly, if you want an a really conscious business, the blueprint has to grow as you're growing the business. So it's a completely different way of starting a business. It's a completely different way of making relationship and investing in relationship. Uh, you're tracking different parameters, um, no lagging indicators whatsoever. Um, so there's, there's a lot of intricacies to this, but the, the emergence of a business uh, is a very different process if we're following the um, the organizing principles of consciousness. Oh. You feel that she's answered your question, Pete? Oh yeah, and some. I'm just processing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, the, for our listeners, here's here's the thing: is that, um, and this really, I think it it relates to what Laban does too. But the very very first thing, if we want to address human consciousness and how humans are, whether humans are woven into the big consciousness or not, we have to first address how we use awareness. What are we aware of? And you know, in the Western world, most people are aware of themselves first, and then the world. And most people are aware of the world in a very linear way. I'm at point A and I need to get to point B. And so this tells me that awareness is working in a, in a very small um, segment of our um, intellectual capacity. We have a part of our brain that is wired to go from A to B to C. It's supposed to, to work that way, but it's a tiny fraction of our creative capacity. It just, after we create something, this linear part of the brain takes a map and we go from A to B to C. But most people are only living in that linear portion. So they see the world as A to B to C. And that linear part of the brain is wired um, with uh, certain ways of choosing. So if I get to point B and there's a little trouble, the map I have might have a B prime. So if I run into trouble at point B, I could choose B prime instead. And we make these instant decisions all the time. But if I'm only, um, if I'm only running awareness in this linear part of my brain, I will start to live in a way that I can only choose one thing or another. I will not be able to hold two things in awareness. So if somebody disagrees with me, I won't be able to entertain their idea. I'll argue instead of learn. And, you know, you can see this at all levels of life, up, up to nation states, you know, it's, it's my nation state, not yours. And I'm threatening you with bombs. You know, it's my culture, not yours. How, how dare you? And, and, and we're really um, polarized because most people are running awareness in this tiny little part of our, of our brain, if you will, and they see the world that way. So it takes a lot of courage to shift, to recognize that in the first place and then to shift it. So as far as my work goes, there aren't um, that many people who are ready for a really big shift. Six star people are already naturally more, I'm gonna say this loosely, more conscious. Six star people are, are naturally using their awareness in much more relational ways, not so many linear ways. But this is really the start of it. Shifting how we use awareness changes us. You know, it, and really the, the first stage of this, I think Laban, you would agree, and I think this is your work, is shifting 
our idea of ourselves. You know, we can see ourselves. If I can do this, then I can do that. Because I cannot do this, I cannot do that. We have these very causal ideas of ourselves and what we're capable of. But if you take somebody, uh, even for a week, if I take somebody out into nature and give them little awareness exercises that are as old as the hills, these are the ways indigenous people have trained their children to know the world, just little things of noticing color, noticing texture, listening for sounds. After a while, they're using awareness a little bit differently. And you don't have to say anything. They will start to feel better about themselves. They'll start to see possibility they didn't see the week before. And this is just consciousness at work. So really the, the key thing for us is broadening how we know the world, changing how we know the world by changing how we use awareness. That's where I start. And, and that's where a lot of people can, um, can change and, and really experience life in a much better, richer way. Um, but then for, for the training that I do, it's, it's really for the serious people who are here to, to be the change makers who want to start businesses or build, um, build communities in a radically different way. That, that's what my deep training is for. But for everybody, um, awareness off of the self for a while and into the world and noticing through the senses, not thinking or explaining, but just being in pure experience, that does a lot of the work. If I could add to to that, Marty, yeah. to, from a from a, a corporate example point of view, I did a presentation to a uh, a huge real estate company in Australia, and I can't mention their name yet because we haven't um, signed all the, the all the other stuff. But the the CEO, I asked him a lot of open questions to begin with. Probably half an hour, I did a lot of listening, and I and I asked him what his goals for the organisation were. And for a CEO, they were quite aggressive, and he loved to come into good businesses and take them great. And I asked him what, what else he wanted to focus on. They wanted to reduce, you know, hiring costs and all the other things and have all this data and stuff. And I said, mm. what about becoming the best real estate company in Australia? And you could see his mind ticking over. Mm. And I said, <laughs> you do realize that you need to be Australia's best real estate CEO. And then you could see his mind going over and over. And I got him at one point out of his chair, yelling at the top of his lungs, I'm the best real estate CEO in the world. <laughs> and and, and what, I, what I was able to explain to him is that by exemplifying that behavior and those values, that all the other stuff that he was worried about getting done, the right. metrics and the hiring, I said, you'll attract the six star candidates. The people will clamor over each other to come and work. You could save yeah. hundreds of thousands of hiring fees. You know, your turnover will go down. People will be fulfilled if you hire people that are engaged that love real estate. And and it was a, such a wonderful moment to see the physical shift in his thinking and, and then what he thought was possible of, all of a sudden. And uh, I think that yeah. just ties in with what you do, Marty. Exactly. This is a shift in how that guy uses awareness and it's shifting him from doing all these little things to being. Mm. And I know those are pretty woo woo words, but literally when we are living in direct experience, we're being something. <clears throat> if I'm worried about all the numbers on a piece of paper and doing all this stuff I'm doing, I'm using the wrong part of my brain. And I won't have a good experience and everything will be too expensive and I won't make good connections. But if I shift that and I be who I am as part of a bigger system, bingo, consciousness, success, costs less money. <laughs> and despite my or snazzy suit, I am the most woo-woo person I know. I've become deeply <laughs> spiritual just in a very short period of time. So I am, and I'm open to everything now. Everything's on the table. Bless you. <laughs> Fabulous, as it should be. <laughs> That's great. Um, I, I I feel I would be we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you, Laban, to give us the story mm. that's brought you to being the world's most courageous and best courage coach. Um, I'm fascinated okay. to hear that. Well, it's a hell of a journey. And it started really six, six years ago. 
And I found myself sitting in my bedroom with three bottles of appropriately priced Pinot Noir coursing its way through my veins, gambling on a horse race on my laptop in a country that I wasn't in, spending money that wasn't mine. And I had this epiphanous moment where I thought to myself, you know what, this isn't the life that you imagined for yourself as a young man. And in the bottom left-hand corner of the laptop, I noticed a phone number. I'd never seen it there before. It must've been on that website thousands of times. And I called the number instinctively and it was the number for the gambler's helpline. And I spoke mm-hmm. to this, this woman, her name's Mary, and I never knew her real last name, but I'll just assume it was Mary Magdalene because she was my guardian angel, whether she knew it or not. And she spoke to me about the incredibly high rates of suicide that, that problem gamblers experience versus the other addictive behaviors because of how quickly you lose everything. Mm-hmm. And this put the fear of God in me and I got access to a, a gambling psychologist for a year and a half. And the very first session, the, the counselor spoke about the link between coping mechanisms developed as a result of growing up in a less than nurturing environment, which is just a really nice way of saying trauma, which for me was nothing more innocuous than being a child of divorce and growing up with parents that were really ill-equipped to esteem themselves fully, let alone their children. And that sent me on this journey of healing and self-discovery. And as my mind and body and soul started to heal, my life started to improve. I removed the desire to want to escape. And I was able to conquer drugs and alcohol and the gambling. And I removed negative self-talk and I lost a heap of weight and put an autoimmune disease into full remission and then met the person in my dreams. And when you go through that kind of journey, you can't keep that to yourself. You got to share that with people that want to hear it and some that don't, but mostly, mostly people that want to hear it. And so I've discovered my purpose, which is to be known as the world's most positively influential speaker and, and the courage, the world's best courage coach is just like the icing on the cake with that. I share my stories unabashed and I don't care what people think of me because what people think of me is none of my business. And when you take ownership, when you take ownership of all of your flaws, no one can hold them against you anymore. I've taken back and reclaimed ownership. And I think when you approach life like that and you share so freely, it creates wonderful deep connections with other human beings that are these other on their way to being a six star or six star people. And through that power of vulnerability, I'm able to connect with people in a way that I never knew was possible. And that has been this journey. And so I feel I have this, this gift of adversity to share with people because no one should go through as much pain as I did for as long as I did, because when you're able to contribute rather than just exist, then we can collectively make the world a better place. And that's why Mm -hmm. I am so incredibly passionate about what I do and I I adore it. And no day ever feels like hard work. It's challenging at times, don't get me wrong. Like, God damn, I love it. (laughs) That's really great. You know, I love uh, one thing in particular you said, Laban, is is the power of disclosure. You know, in in South America, they, they say that disclosure is the glue that keeps communities together. And it's opposite to Western culture. We want to hide stuff. We don't want to say we keep our little secrets, but but we keep ourselves apart. And if we keep ourselves apart, then then we have less power. We have less um, fewer connections to do the things that we were really here to do. So um, this fabulous story, Layman. That's really great. Thanks, Marty. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I have to say, I have read the first chapter of Layman's book. And I literally just wanted to keep reading. So he goes into a lot more colourful detail. Yeah. Um, there's another story in there. And it was just like, yeah. I, I, so what's the name of your book, Laban, that's coming up? Bet on you. Bet on you. Yeah. You are a one in 400 million sperm miracle. Bet on you. Oh, I love it. <laughs> that's not the whole title. I it's just it. bet on you. but. <laughs> 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 well, I like the rest of it too. That was very good. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be available uh, on every English speaking Amazon website uh, by December at the very latest and available on Audible, paperback, and Kindle as well. So, or recorded in my voice. 
Very impressive. Beautiful. I'm very yeah. excited. Yes. Thank you for that. Two amazing mm. stories from two amazing people. Thank you for sharing. Mm. Insights Thanks, around. Pleasure. Um, I'm conscious of the time. We did go over. I wish I could just keep talking to you too. Uh, what, what, um, as, we, as we kind of bring this in to sort of close it out, I'd, I'd love to get a, just something to give our listeners, sort of like if you could give them one piece of advice or one, one thing that they could think about, ponder and, and process today, what would that be? Mm. You go first, Marty. Uh, I knew you were going to say that. I Unless would you say, want me to. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is fine. It's fine. Um, the, the thing that strikes me, and I think about this every day, is um, I would invite people to every day, at least once a week, see if you can stand outside and imagine yourself as part of the whole planet. See if you can imagine the size of the planet and imagine your size on the planet and see if you can feel the whole thing and you're part of it. If you can stretch your imagination and your senses to feel that and see it and taste it and know it, it will change you for the better. Awesome. So powerful. <laughs> I love my grounding, Marty. So I'll be out there with my bare feet. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> my, my, my suggestion to the world is simply something that has worked so beautifully for me. And I do try to make sure that anything that I share is my own experience. And I never like to finger waggle. But if you set a, a jar up in your home, and instead of putting money in there when you curse, swear, blaspheme, whatever you want to do, Every single time you say something negative about yourself, $5, five pounds, five euros, 50 pesos, and remove all negative self-talk from your life and watch your life transform for the better. Wow. Because when you do that, you start paying attention to how other people talk. And we become like the five people we spend the most time around and if you are to succeed and to find your purpose and to connect with the, with the universe, there's going to be people that are want to, going to want to tap, drag you down to their level. And don't be afraid to cut them loose, but start on the self-talk and watch your life change for the better. Wow. That is awesome. And I'm just thinking about the swear jar we have in the pantry, but that's for my 10-year-olds, not for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> we believe you have we believe you <laughs> That's uh, amazing well thank you Laban um, in Mexico thank you Marty in San Francisco thank mm -hmm. you Pete in the UK and thank you to thank the you. listeners from here in Australia and thank just... you Av in Australia <laughs> Just yes. so much thanks to go around. So much love and thanks. I, uh, I've just thoroughly enjoyed this. I wish you a blessed day and I can't wait to listen to this episode again and share it with the world because it truly is six star. Muchas gracias. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you all. Adios, amigos. <laughs> yeah. Tu penanches kama.